<clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. St. Leo the Great, who was Pope around the year 450, said these words about the city of Rome. But this city did not know the one who was the author of her power. And while she ruled almost all nations, she preserved the errors of all nations. And because she rejected no false worship, she seemed in her own eyes to be most religious. Hence, the more firmly she was held in slavery by the devil, the greater miracle was her liberation through Christ. Yesterday was the feast of Saints Peter and Paul, and today is the commemoration of St. Paul. The feast of Saints Peter and Paul is the feast of the Catholic Church. For the Catholic Church is nothing else than a society of men founded by God for the purpose of carrying out the salvation of souls. In order to accomplish this end, God has given his church, that is, to the men in it who are endowed with authority, the power to teach, to rule, and to sanctify in his name by his authority. By her teaching power, she has the right to point out authoritatively what the revelation of God is and to require that the faithful adhere to these dogmatic judgments. And we know this from the words of Christ before he ascended into heaven when he said to the apostles, Going, therefore, teach ye all nations. By her power to rule... She has received from Christ the power to make laws designed to bring the faithful to eternal salvation, such as laws of fasting, laws concerning matrimony. And this she received when our Lord said to them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And by her power to sanctify, she uses the sacraments instituted by Christ to confer grace upon those who accept her teachings. And we know this when Christ said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And in these three sacred functions, Christ has promised his perpetual assistance, for he said to them at the very same time, and behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. The apostles were the very men to whom this power was given. When these powers of teaching, ruling, and sanctifying are united with living men, the result is the church. These living men that were united to this power were the apostles. The word apostle means sent because they were sent by Christ. They had a mission from Christ and therefore authority from Christ. Hence, one of the signs of the true Church of Christ is that it is apostolic. That it be able to trace its origins back to the apostles. For in order to have power from Christ, one must be linked to Christ by a chain of succession. He is the source of the power of the Church. And in order for the church to claim power, the church must be linked to him by a chain of succession. If that chain is broken, then there can be no claim of authority. Furthermore, the true church of Christ must be apostolic in doctrine, which means that it must preserve intact and continue to teach the doctrines which the apostles taught. 
for the church's fidelity to apostolic doctrine is the first of all of her duties. For she cannot pour the waters of baptism on anyone unless he has first accepted the faith. And unless she preach the faith faithfully and without error, then she cannot sanctify anyone. St. Peter and St. Paul are the most prominent of the apostles. St. Peter is the prince of the apostles and as head of the church contains within himself the essence of the church, the kernel of the church. Because the, he has been set above the whole flock by Christ. And therefore, no one can claim to be an apostle unless a portion of the flock has been confided to him by Peter. Peter is the vicar of Christ, and therefore, as Christ is the source of all authority, also his vicar is the source of all authority in the church. Therefore, no one can claim to be sent by Christ unless he is sent by his vicar. You cannot, therefore, participate in the church unless you participate in Peter. St. Paul was chosen by Christ to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. He had extraordinary zeal and talent for preaching and was therefore chosen by Christ in a most extraordinary manner. He had been the most ferocious of the persecutors of the church, but in an instant, by the grace of God, he was changed into a zealous apostle of the faith. His remarkable conversion should remind us of the power of God's grace. St. Paul traveled throughout the eastern part of the Roman Empire and converted many to the faith until finally he met up with St. Peter in Rome. Now the shedding of the blood of these two apostles consecrated the city of Rome. Nero, who was the Roman emperor in the 60s A.D., eager to shift the blame for the burning of Rome from himself, which he in fact did, he falsely accused the Christians of having set it ablaze. In this first and horrifying persecution of the faith, in which Nero actually made human torches out of the first Catholics, in order to illuminate his gardens, St. Peter and Paul valiantly on the same day offered their lives to God in martyrdom. St. Peter in the Circus of Nero, right next to what is now St. Peter's Basilica, and St. Paul outside the walls. And there are two great basilicas marking those spots now, St. Peter's, Basilica on the Vatican Hill and also the church of St. Paul outside the walls and the obelisk which stood in the circus of Nero which had been brought from Egypt by the Roman emperors by the Emperor Augustus in particular that obelisk now stands in the middle of St. Peter's Square for it was fitting that as it was witness to the crucifixion of St. Peter and the humiliation, therefore, of the church in St. Peter, it should also be witness to the humiliation of Roman paganism and the victory of the fishermen. But for the Romans, in putting these two men to death, there was nothing extraordinary. They were just two more executions. Nevertheless, the fate of Rome was sealed that day. The blood of these two men, 
these two great apostles, was so powerful that it would wash Rome of her paganism and her debauchery and make her the center of divine truth. They knew it not, but their history was forever changed. And now if you go to Rome, you will see the glory and the triumph of the blood of these martyrs in the magnificence of the churches that are built. And if you go to the forum, you will see nothing but ruin and decay indicating the death of paganism and the death of the church's persecutors. It is like a skeleton of pagan Rome. The hymn of this feast sings these words. The hymn of St. Peter and Paul says, O happy Rome, who in thy martyr prince's blood a twofold stream art washed and doubly sanctified. All earthly beauty thou alone outshinest far, empurpled by their outpoured life's blood glorious tide. Rome today is unfortunately occupied by the enemies of the faith, like new pagans. They have come and placed themselves in our churches. This is well known to you, that we are living in a time of the fulfillment of the highest hopes of the enemies of the church over the past two centuries. To place upon the chair of Peter someone who is favorable to the ideas of naturalism and liberalism. While these enemies, by means of stealth and deceit, have come to these places in our churches through the legal channels and do therefore preserve the legal ties with the apostles, they have nonetheless abandoned the faith and teach condemned doctrines supposedly in the name of Christ. But this promulgation of false doctrine coupled with the promulgation of false worship and false discipline is a sure sign that these shepherds are false shepherds and do not represent Christ and are not sent by Christ. For the purpose of that chair of Peter, the purpose of the authority of Peter, is to teach the faith. And as I said, the faith is the first and most important duty of the church. To be faithful to Christ and to the apostles, it is therefore necessary to reject these heretics as false shepherds. For how can we today venerate these two great apostles if we have abandoned the doctrine which they taught with the authority of Christ and for which they gave their lives? And there is but a single solution to the church's problem, and that is to pray. When St. Peter was imprisoned by Herod, the church prayed fervently and without ceasing. So during this period when the church is itself held captive by her enemies, we must continue to pray. Our efforts of providing the traditional mass and sacraments, as well as the efforts of many other priests like ourselves, while they are noble and necessary, will never amount to a solution to the church's problems. It is only when the chair of Peter is possessed by someone who adheres to apostolic doctrine and who therefore condemns the condemned doctrines will the church be set aright. In the meantime, the expression of St. Athanasius is fulfilled and verified, referring to the Arian heretics of his time. They have the churches, but we have the faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.